Tom Mason. Um, I actually went to university here. I think the guys from Tech Exeter are calling me hyper local. I live in Exeter, I work in Exeter. Um, I've helped grow two companies um, that have all been based in and around this region. I'm currently working at Nexus Mods. Don't know if any of you play computer games. No? <laughs> Got a few gamers. Um, yeah, we are a kind of social network file store uh, website. We've got almost 18 million members. Um, we do quite a lot of traffic, um, kind of not particularly well known to the wider world, but quite a lot of stuff, um, you know, quite a lot of stuff going on. Um, I joined 2016 to try and help bring what is quite an archaic website into the, well, halfway through the 21st century. <laughs> We're kind of getting there. Um, what we're going to cover in this talk, what's the problem? I think quite a lot of the talks already today have gone over what some of the problems are, but we'll just go through a few again. And I'm a developer. I'm not a security person. I'm not a security expert. I'm a developer. I want to make sure that the code and the stuff that we are writing as developers helps everybody else. We try to cut down on, you know, code going up that could be vulnerable. So we're going to go through the stages of our pipeline and give a few examples of what we can do. So Docker, we all know Docker is taking over. Um, yeah, like I said, I've been responsible for coming into Nexus Mods, moving everything from a kind of standard, uh, stuff was on virtual machines, stuff was on dedicated servers, um, doesn't really scale at all, um, especially when you're dealing with uh, whatever I was talking about here, seven billion requests a month doesn't really scale, especially when new games come out and you need to deal with, you know, uh, a million users in a day. So Kubernetes is in, containers are in. Since we've deployed Kubernetes and Docker containers, there's been two security problems that we've actually had internally. The first was great. It was as we were getting to use Kubernetes. Um, we deployed our test cluster. We left it running overnight. Uh, I think it was over the weekend, actually. We put some demo workloads on it. Came back Monday morning, kind of it was a proof of concept, wasn't really particularly well secured. The whole thing was when, uh, running cryptocurrency mining. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was a good start. Kind of, um, you know, opened our eyes up to, yeah, this is probably a problem. Uh, someone had compromised to one of the web VMs, uh, sorry, one of the web containers, which wasn't particularly well secured, escalated themselves up, uh, had root permissions and was just running crypto stuff. I doubt they made much money, um, but you never know. Um, and the second problem we had was actually quite recently, we try and move, when we can, we try and move our legacy code that some of it's still running in virtual machines, some of it's still running on dedicated servers. We try and move it into containers, um, and we've seen well, one problem specifically, moving a load of old legacy PHP stuff over, um, slight misconfiguration in some of the config, user error, <laughs> my user error, um, meant that some HT uh, access rules weren't being properly uh, used and somebody tried to hack the container because um, it's running out of date legacy software, which we know about and we've protected. Uh, luckily, we caught it pretty much instantly and nothing happened, but these things are out there, uh, it's happening, so yeah. Um, luckily, none of you have heard of Nexus Mods, which is great, so I can move past this slide, um, but if you've ever used Have I Been Pwned, we've been pwned. Uh, I wasn't at the company at the time, but we lost almost six million uh, username and password credentials, which are out on the internet. So. Um, yeah, if you want to know what my password was on the 22nd of July 2013, you can go and find it. Um, that hasn't happened again since, thankfully, and it kind of wasn't a hack, but let's pretend we didn't, do that. We didn't know about that. Um, so yeah, to do this, do this talk, I went off and did some research. Uh, we use Datadog, big fans of Datadog, and if anyone's seen it, there's other platforms out there. Uh, there's other surveys out there, but this one's good. They reckon... Uh, as of this year, this is quite a, a new survey, 25% uh, of companies have got Docker, uh, rises to around 40% for large deployments. So large deployments means you've got almost a thousand containers, I think, which sounds like a lot, but 
that isn't. I think we're up to uh, three, four hundred production containers. Um, and that's not a huge workload in the grand scheme of things. 50% of people are using orchestration. What are the other 50% doing? Um, are you putting up Docker containers without any kind of orchestration? Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. 70% uh, obviously using Kubernetes and the technology in use is what we're using, Nginx, Redis, Postgres, it's web tech, right? Websites get hacked, they're public facing. This is the problem. Um, some random surveys here. These guys seem like they knew what they were talking about. They've got enterprise in their name. Cyber, cyber security <laughs> professionals. Most of the cyber security professionals I know try and sell software um, to you, and you probably know about more than cyber security than they do, um, but they want to just sell you stuff. So they're concerned about it. What they're concerned about increased cost, complexity, compliance, security standards, lack of mutual solutions, loose access and controls and they don't have the tools to monitor stuff. Okay, going through that nice and quick. Let's see what we can do about that. What else was I looking at? This is cool. Popular Docker images. Someone runs a nice little website down here which gets updated every day. Vulnerable containers has a list of the top 1,000 images on Docker Hub. What's the first thing you do when you want a new image? You go to, uh, you go to Docker Hub. Yeah, oh, great, That's, that looks good. Those images have vulnerabilities all through them. 20% um, of them have a critical vulnerability, as in you're going to get hacked. If you put this up, it should have been fixed. I think one of the guys earlier was saying CV level 10. This, I th think, critical is eight and above, something like that. It's pretty bad. Um, and 60% have medium vulnerabilities. Our config, we wouldn't let this stuff go live. It wouldn't get past our pipelines. Um, for new tech, legacy stuff, like the guys were saying, sometimes you have to let it go. But these images have 21 billion downloads. So yeah, people are using this stuff, it's out there. Um, Docker Hub, Docker's a company, they run the registry, they want you using these containers, they want as many containers up as possible. You probably can't read this, but they're not great. Um, compromised containers go up all the time, they get reported. This is an example someone uploaded a container August 20, it might get better now, we're 2018 here, it's quite old. Uh, up, uploaded August 2017, uh, was reported as being full of vulnerabilities, uh, not being full of but having actual uh, malicious code in it, September the 1st, didn't go offline until uh, May 10th, 2018. Brilliant. Um, 10 months, the person who did it uploaded 17 images, 5 million downloads. Guess what it was doing? It was mining cryptocurrency, everyone's favorite game. Had over 5 million downloads. Uh, supposedly, there's still plenty of containers running this code. Uh, the person's still making money. Uh, when I looked at it the other day, they'd made 90,000 at today's money if they were clever and they sold a couple of months ago when it was high, they would think they may, would have made about half a million dollars. So this stuff's out there, that's the problem. What can we as developers do about it? Uh, yeah. Use Docker, <laughs> brilliant. Um, I've got quite a few friends who live and work in London. Uh, a few of them work for a, a tech startup and they do everything, they hear all the buzzwords. Microservices, Node.js, blah, blah, blah. Friday parties with a DJ in the office, everything. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's the life. And um, they know that I'm into my DevOps, I enjoy doing this stuff and they ask for help. And one of them asked for help the other day and I know exactly what his stuff does. He sent me pictures through of his pipelines, um, everything, the, the infrastructure. And I said, send me, your, send me the Docker container, send me the config to run it. And he said, that I don't use that for development. I develop locally, and then it gets turned into a Docker container when it goes live. I don't know what to say about that. Um, <laughs> I said, you, you've got 50 microservices running Node.js. And he sent me through a screenshot of his terminal and he had 50 terminal windows open, all running dev Node.js library uh, apps. And it was the same throughout the office. And he was on Linux and another guy was on OSX. And it, if you're using Docker, use it properly. It's for developers. It needs to be everywhere and it needs to be part of your pipeline Here's my pipeline. Um, 
this is a kind of pseudo pipeline. It probably isn't the same as your pipeline um, for doing your code. We are coding, we're testing, we're building our Docker images. We need to run our Docker images somewhere. And then once they are built and up and in production, we need to watch them. So like I said, it's a pseudo pipeline. You're probably building your images much sooner. You're probably coding on your Docker images. You're probably testing on your Docker images. And then you're putting those live when they're ready, right? Yeah, OK, so coding. I put some health checks in here. It's, yeah, not sure they're too relevant. It's the question, how long does it take you to set up your development environment? If I came to work at your office tomorrow and you give me a brand new laptop, how long before I can commit code to production and you trust me to commit code to production? If ignoring, all, ignoring how good my code is, <laughs> you might not agree with how good my code is. If that takes more than an hour, your pipeline sucks. Um, if you came to work at Nexus Mods tomorrow, um, we'd give you a laptop and you should be set up with the full everything within an hour. Rory here started at Nexus Mods about three months ago, so hopefully you can give the thumbs up. <laughs> Roughly an hour, yeah. Um, so what can we do? Code, if your code sucks, your code sucks. Docker isn't gonna help you, nothing's gonna help you. Um, I can't help you, there's no advice that can help you. You need, you know, code reviews, normal stuff, you code, you get it code reviewed. Um, Seb earlier was talking about it being a social problem. I completely agree, but we just want to focus on the tools here. I like linting everything. It's amazing. Some of the developers on our team hate it because it changes all their code. Oh, I like curly braces, but you know, curly braces don't go here. You can lint everything. We use a lot of Go, we use a lot of Ruby. Um, you can even lint your own Docker files. So if your Docker, Docker files suck, they can get linted as well. Brilliant. If you don't know what linting is, um, it will go through your code, see what you've written. If there's anything completely obvious, it runs against a suite of rules that the lint tool knows about. It will go through security stuff. It will see um, if your methods are too complicated, uh, if you're using you know, code that shouldn't be there because it never gets run. It will suggest it all, and for the most part, it can tidy it all up, uh, which is great when you've got a load of tests. So you want your tests uh, for your code, because if you run a lint tool over it, I ran one the other day on a public gem that we just released, and it changed something like 800 lines of code, and the test suite worked before, and it worked after, um, which means that 100%, right? What percentage of your code base is tested, 100%? Yeah, new code, we force it, um, almost, don't tell anyone, Rory. 100% of new stuff, legacy code, not so much, uh, but if we're making new things, we, co uh, sorry, we test it, and we reject commits and deployments if the code coverage isn't 100%. And we're not just talking unit tests, um, we write web apps, we write uh, web-facing code, all of it, it's 100% tested, the con containers are tested, the unit, uh, sorry, there's unit testing, Hopefully, for some stuff that spans multiple services, there's integration testing as well. You know, it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect um, thing for security, but it means that you know that your code base is happy, so when your uh, level 10 CVE comes along and you can go, oh no, I need to update this gem or this dependency, you can update it, you're happy, the tests still pass. I know that nothing's blowing up, Great, I can fix that CV right now. So there isn't a huge amount to talk about testing. Um, if you want to, I saw some slides on this from Docker Comp. They were suggesting that you can add security tests to your suite. So if you know that there's something you've missed before um, that you desperately need, you can add extra security tests. I've never done this. Um, so I'm not really sure, but one of the suggestions they were saying, you can test your TLS ciphers. So if you're uh, apps directly receive data, which they shouldn't, we'll cover that later, um, then you could test that. If you want to be PCI DSS compliant, for example. Um, so yeah, what we do want to test is we want to test our internal code dependencies. 
So this is all supposed to be nicely coloured, but I'm afraid that's kind of been lost by this very high quality projector. Um, but yeah, during our pipelines, we are testing our code. So you can see 100% test coverage, yay, brilliant. Um, and we're also uh, testing the uh, modules that we've used, other people's modules, to see if there are any CV scans, uh, sorry, uh, CV problems. And if you're using any language that has, um, using any language uh, that uses modules, we do this for Go, we do this for Ruby, um, obviously you get it for Node, um, that stuff, there, there will be something you can run to check against dependencies. Going on from that, you actually want to scan during the testing phase your entire image. So you're using someone else's image, very likely, unless you built your image from scratch, which yeah, probably not. Um, there's loads of tools out there. Uh, they vary in complexity. They're not the easiest to integrate. Uh, I quite like Aqua Microscanner, um, which is a tiny little baked in image tester that uh, will run during your Docker build and it will check the um, whole image that you've put in for any, any problem. So, you know, if you're using a Ubuntu image, or you're using Debian, it will pick up all the stuff and it will alert you. The same way in our pipeline here, we're getting alerted that, again, you can't really read this, I'm afraid, but this is actually from yesterday, I think. Uh, so I think this is probably from our API. We've got a high CVE saying that Nokogiri, which is a Ruby gem, if you've ever used Ruby, is just constantly needs updating. Uh, it's one of the most annoying gems in the world ever. You always find something requires it. It's always getting CVE. It deals with um, CSS and XML, so I suppose it's kind of at the forefront of stuff. Uh, but you get the same message. You'd have something like um, OpenSSH is out of date, and you can, you can cancel it at a very early stage. Don't push that. A developer can deal with it. So moving on, these are kind of, like I said, in the wrong way. You probably would have put building Docker images earlier, um, but I'm doing the pseudo. We code, we test. Now we want to build our Docker images. How can we keep our Docker images a little bit safer? So default, if you go to any tutorial, how do I use Docker? How do I do this for Docker? What's the Node.js image? It will tell you Docker pool something something. Great, Docker pool Ubuntu latest or from Ubuntu latest, that gets me the latest Ubuntu image, which to be honest is probably a bad example. It's probably quite safe because Ubuntu latest is a Docker verified image, so it should be fine. Um, but we have seen problems with these in the past. We had problems with an official Ruby image that just automatically got pulled down and took our production environment down for roughly two hours while we were trying to work out what the problem was. Um, and the problem was the Docker image that had been put that was official didn't work. Um, and of course, we were rolling back our commits. Who changed this code? Still doesn't work. Turns out the Docker image had been updated. We didn't notice. So you can pull your Docker images by the full hash, so you get the exact image that you had at the time and you don't get the upstream updates, um, which can be bad. You might want the upstream updates uh, if your thing, you know, if your app that's out there running Docker isn't super critical, you might say that actually the security provided by the latest Ubuntu stuff is probably better than, for me than having this thing up 100% of the time and I'm willing to take that one to two hour downtime every year that's up to you. So same, going back to the Ubuntu official images, um, we can start with Docker official images. Now this is really confusing. I'm always confused about this. Uh, if you go on Docker Hub, again, run by Docker, they've got official images, they've got verified images, and they've got Docker certified images. And they're three different categories. Uh, which ones do you trust? Uh, yeah, I made a nice little image, took me ages. Um, <laughs> The official images are made by the company Docker, so when you get Ubuntu latest or Debian latest, um, they're made by Docker, they've been tested, they've been uh, manually verified by a human to say this worked, I know this, is, this sounds bad, everyone's saying don't use humans, but the, the tests have been run by a human and someone said the CVs are all fine, I'm happy with that, this is now official. Um, verified ones, don't trust verified images, Sounds like a good word, right? Verified, this is verified. That just means that the um, image is from who it says it's from. 
So I think the image that we had a problem with was a verified one. It was from Ruby. Ruby had made the image. It was verified. Great, cheers guys. But it isn't certified. <laughs> certified is a small section of verified images that have been verified by Docker themselves. And they get this cool little logo. <laughs> Docker certified. Yay, that's good. But the official images don't get this logo, <laughs> right? So good luck. Um, official images, certified images, they're your friend. Good luck working out. Um, always use stripped down base images. So don't just grab Ubuntu latest because it's massive. Certainly don't just grab node.latest, which I think is the most vulnerable image ever known to man. Um, yeah, it's horrible. So always start low. If you're going to use, this is node, for example, um, from Sneak, who uh, we were talking about a minute ago. Node 10 slim. I think usually the slim images use something like Debian, uh, stretch possibly. Um, it's a bit better. This is the number of vulnerabilities found last time this ran. Um, yeah. Do you want to put something live with 567 vulnerabilities? I'm guessing not. 65, probably not. Uh, my favorite is Alpine. Uh, node, yeah, no 10 Alpine, zero vulnerabilities. Probably because there's pretty much nothing in the image. Like, there's no uh, bash, there's no, it doesn't know anything. We had a problem with Alpine the other day um, and it didn't even have locales. So we were kind of, we were trying to, um, someone had uploaded files with um, Chinese or Japanese, I can't remember which one, um, characters in them and they, you couldn't read them on the command line. So we were running commands against them and you're like, what? What's going on here? Yeah, Alpine 10, no locales. So it's, it's lightweight. Um, bit of a warning here, even if you do do best practices, this was earlier this year, Alpine Linux, um, stripped down base image, seems fine. Turns out since 2015, they've been shipping uh, with a null password for the root user. Uh, always good. It wasn't quite as bad as it sounds. You couldn't just type SU root. Um, there was a bit of nuance to getting it done, but you're never safe, uh, is the answer. If you can, make your containers read-only. If your containers aren't doing anything that requires read and write access, we've got plenty of Go containers out and about that um, will take a message from somewhere, user wants something, it will go to a database, and then it will build something, and it will chuck it in Redis for later use, or we'll return it to the user. They have no reason to have file access. So if they ever get hacked, user comes in, you know, it might have some credentials in there, they might be able to get to the Redis server, they might be able to see a queue of messages that says, you know, please do these tasks. Not the end of the world, still not great, you don't want to be hacked, but read-only file system, really, really good. Um, you can, if you're running like a web server, we do this. If you have web servers that don't need to read or write, they're just providing stuff, um, their session stores are somewhere else. Uh, but they need a PID file, you know, they need, they need something to make sure that the uh, server's running. Then you can, set, um, you can set very small temp file systems um, that they can use. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we touched on this a minute ago in the previous talk. Um, that policy would be amazing. I love the sound of that policy. Don't run as root. If I could make no containers run as root, on our Kubernetes uh, cluster, using a policy like that, I would be very happy. You, the, you have to remember the Docker um, service on your computer runs as root. So if you're running your containers as root, which it will do by default, by the way, um, you know, if you don't set up a user and use the user, you're going to be running it, running it as root. And definitely don't use privilege flags. And if you <laughs> don't use privilege flags, and root user, or well, you shouldn't use privilege flag at all, because um, if you're using the privilege flag on your Docker containers, it treats them, uh, not quite, but they pretty much have the same capabilities as having root access on your machine. So um, yeah, enables pretty much, not all, I've written all, all um, kernel capabilities, not quite true, um, but most. So here's a quick example, um, just running at the top, Again, you probably can't see this great, but you can see there's a lot down here and not much at the top. So the first line is, um, is the kernel, not the kernel, sorry, this is what you can see in dev 
forward slash dev in non-privilege mode. You can do some stuff, pretty useful. You might want to use all that stuff. You enable privilege mode. There's my hard drive, NVMe 0, N1. Uh, my network interface is on here somewhere. So someone hacks this, they can format my hard drive. Not ideal, don't use privileged ever, if you can. Um, so yeah, moving on further down our pipeline, we're gonna go to run. So we've built these images. There are plenty more stuff, by the way, um, that we can do to do this. It's just, we've only got 45 minutes. I'm rushing through it already. Uh, this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, trying to keep us as safe as possible. Uh, we now have built our containers. We're relatively happy with them. We want to chuck them up to production. Now, uh, Carrie had already, already did this for us, knocked it out of the park. We don't really need to talk about it. If you're at that talk, don't use, uh, don't put your secrets in your environment variables. Uh, obviously, worst case, put them in your GitHub repository. Terrible, really terrible. Uh, second worst case, putting them in environment variables, still not great. Almost as bad, mounting them as flat files, a little bit better, but the best still, as Carrie had said, key management service, every cloud has one. Um, there's a Google Cloud one, there's an AWS one. It saves you a lot of headache, so look into doing that. Um, if, you are, if you aren't using Kubernetes, um, and you are using something else, Docker Swarm, or you're hosting your own Docker for some reason, uh, you might be one of those 50% of people who aren't using orchestration. Um, my advice would be use orchestration, um, make it somebody else's problem if you want to put it in a public cloud so that you know looking after the host isn't necessarily your problem. But if you are, there's Docker Bench, a pretty cool tool which you can even run locally if you want. It will run through your development environment and um, tell you loads of stuff that's wrong with your containers. So if you were running stuff in here that was using root, or you've got containers that access ports below uh, 1,000 or whatever it is. Um, it will just go through best, good best practices. Um, again, they kind of scratch the service. There's, there's plenty more um, that Dockerbench doesn't check, but if you were to get, I think there's 100 at the last running of the tool when I ran it. Um, I think this was it, yeah. So 5th of September, there was 111 checks, but I ran it on my laptop and I passed four. In my development environment, I'm pretty sure we'd pass more than that on production, um, I hope. So yeah, you, you can have a look at that. I mean, I already failed by not having Docker up to date, so that didn't, that didn't go very well. Um, if you're really hardcore, you can write yourself some AppArmor profiles. I don't know if anyone's ever used AppArmor before. Uh, quite, you know, you've got, in Linux, you've got SE Linux, you've got AppArmor. You can pretty much nail down your uh, Docker image to only be allowed to do certain things. So you can go as far as saying what processes can run, um, what network ports are open, effectively what sockets allow it's allowed to open. Um, so that means if somebody did get on your container, did compromise the container and they tried to upload their own executable or edit it and change it, it just simply wouldn't run. This is uh, one of the most powerful things, but it's incredibly complicated to write. I mean, I, I think it is. The uh, documentation, uh, sorry, the documentation's fine, but the actual reading of the config files, digesting them, understanding them, uh, you know, it's not something you look forward to. Um, so I don't think many people do that. Um, this is cool though. I found a, a cool tool which we are slowly rolling out. Um, we haven't put anything in production that I've ran it through yet, but it was done, I can't remember when. Uh, it was at a Docker conference, uh, like hackathon, and there was a competition to make tools um, for Docker, and they made a really cool tool called Docker Slim. And um, I mean, my favorite bit isn't the security stuff. The security stuff's cool, um, but it minifies, minifies your images. Um, if you've ever had to manage a lot of Docker images and, um, you know, are doing, we do instant um, CI, CD, so you can deploy your stuff at any time. You know, if you want to deploy it, we're not in the office today, but if the guys decided to just deploy every single service again right now, shouldn't be a problem. All the tests pass, everyone's happy. Uh, the problem is, you know, we're talking probably, I think the last time I checked, we've got four, five, maybe even 600 gig of images in our system that every now and then need flushing out. Um, and when you've got that over multiple hosts and you don't keep on top of it, it does get a bit annoying. So minifying's cool. 
uh, really cool. You know, we're running Go, you go from 700 meg to 1.56 meg for a container. Uh, makes a real difference in the, uh, in the pipeline, just boom, move, move that around. Um, but the cool thing, I guess, from a security point, we're talking about security, um, is it can build an app armor profile automatically. So it will, the latest version of Docker Slim can take your Docker file. Uh, the older versions could just take a Docker image you'd already built and then it would minify that. The new version can take an actual Docker file and it will build you a slimmed down version um, of your image with an app armor profile ready to go. And it's pretty good. I, I haven't had any problems. We build relatively simple services. I think if you had a Docker container that did too much, which is obviously bad, it's supposed to be only doing one job, then it might struggle, but everything I've tried it on worked really well. Um, going back to this test we were talking about earlier, and um, uh, some stuff I think Oli touched on a minute ago about not allowing users to build um, load balances, maybe not the same, but a little bit similar, is don't send traffic directly to your containers, ever. Um, I don't really know why you do that. Uh, especially in production, they need to go through a load balancer, um, or, you know, hopefully in your Kubernetes cluster, um, and you want them to go through somebody else's. Uh, for someone like us, when we have people attacking us all the time, um, you know, before DOS protection became a thing, uh, I'd say Nexus Mods was probably offline two or three hours a month from people who are just able to saturate 100 gig, 100 gig lines. Um, just because they felt like it, whereas now everything goes via Cloudflare. So I uh, don't know if you saw the demo earlier of um, you know, sending SQL ex exploits. You obviously don't want that in your code. Hopefully you're linting earlier on and your code review will have caught that. If somehow it's managed to get through, things like Cloudflare will generally pick out all that stuff and it's really, really good. Um, and you want to take this, the stuff like the SSL and TLS pain away from your container, um, which is why you want it to go through the load balancer. You configure it in one place. Um, you know, you obviously share your SSL certificates across your whole infrastructure, and you aren't having to write horrible code and dealing with SSL and, and TLS. So hopefully we've got this far. We've deployed our, uh, we've deployed our containers. They're running in production. Um, we want to watch stuff. Right, it doesn't stop here. So it doesn't stop here. It kind of starts here now. Um, your stuff's live. It's in production. People are going to attack it. Um, we log everything, literally everything. Um, not users' passwords, not secure stuff, stuff that can break GDPR, which is obviously fun now, having to go through and take out stuff that shouldn't be there. Um, I mean, as an example, this is just one of our applications. Last 30 days, almost 300 million um, hits to it, and we've logged every single one of them. And if you went back a year, that would all be there. You know, we're talking billions, billions of um, lines of logs is not a problem anymore. Kibana, Elastic, use it. It's cheap, it's so cheap um, that there shouldn't be an excuse just not to log everything. If anything goes wrong, you can come back later. Uh, monitor the, um, monitor your Docker containers. We used, again, like I said earlier, we used Datadog. There are many other application performance monitoring, APM, there's many other solutions out there. If you're not using them, then you really need to be. Um, even if it's not necessarily a security thing, you can see where your code's slow. Um, it will help you with all kinds of things like that. And one of the things for security is we watch our errors really, really closely. Um, it's one of the best things that we found for catching stuff early is uh, just every service has a, a certain threshold. So if errors go above even something as low as like 0.01%, this is what, this is the past hour, this is three errors. It's probably normal. If that went to 20 errors, we'd be uh, wanting to look into what was going on and checking to see if somebody was running or trying to do something they shouldn't be doing and we can get ahead of it nice and early. So we get alerted in Slack when stuff goes over its threshold and. That would be one of the things you can do. Um, one of the, so we were talking earlier about scanning your images at the testing stage. So in your deployment pipeline, you wanna test your images. Um, but that's fine if you're like us and you deploy 
I, I, if I went and looked on, I think we, we, we're using GitLab, if I went and looked, we've probably deployed 500 times this year, maybe more. Um, you know, it's a daily thing, no one thinks about it. If your code's passing its tests and everyone's happy, then it goes live. Someone's there to fix it if it goes wrong. Might not work in your use case, you might be deploying workloads in a sprint every month, every two months, every six months. You know, that's, from my, in my opinion, I'm very opinionated, that's bad, you shouldn't be doing that. You wanna be deploying all the time. Um, but your use case might be different, and if it is, you wanna be scanning you, your images in real time while they're running, um, which is quite hard to do. There's plenty of, um, it's not hard to do if you're willing to pay someone lots of money to do it. Um, so like we were talking about earlier, um, Ollie was talking about Sneak and we saw it earlier. Looks great, uh, it's expensive. If you're someone like us, you know, we're a small team. Um, it's expensive to get that kind of <coughs> level of um, uh, vulnerability scanning, but other people do it, Aqua. Um, I think some of the cloud services, Google Cloud Service have, uh, sorry, uh, Google Kubernetes engine have started touching on this. They definitely let you scan your images in their pipeline, and I think they're starting to offer um, scanning of your running images. But it's a bit like you can imagine, like it's a virus scan. You know, just because you virus scanned your computer today doesn't mean that it's gonna be happy and CV free tomorrow. Um, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we can reuse some of the uh, earlier tools that we were talking about, which I didn't really talk about, um, but for scanning, and there's some here that are free, Anchor, Claire, Dagda, Twistlock isn't actually free, I'm not sure if Dagda is, but Anchor and Claire are definitely free. You can do this stuff for free, uh, and you can just set up jobs that scan your images every day. Um, so yeah, how does this look? What did we say earlier? Um, increased cost and complex complexity? Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, from our experience, uh, increased cost, no. Moving to containers is cheaper, way cheaper than uh, way way cheaper than hardware. Complexity, it's just a different problem. It's just a newer problem. Yes, containers might be more complex. Not really sure. Um, verifying images to meet their compliance and security standards. We've pretty much nailed that, right? We can scan them in real time. Uh, we can scan them. We can break our pipeline if they do break stuff. I'm happy with that. Um, lack of mature solutions available. That is. Still a problem. It's a it's an emerging technology. Um, even it's not really an emerging technology, but it's only really been, you know, bandwagoned on recently. So there is a lack of mature solutions available. But the proof is that there's lots of people in the marketplace. There isn't just one person going. Containers need scanning. Here's a product. There are 20, 30, and there are big people getting involved. So yeah, um, this is good. I was worried about this one. Loose access control between containers. Um, Carrie had covered it. Thank you, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I was worried about that one, didn't have an answer to it. You've answered it. Um, yeah, and um, don't have the tools to monitor transient containers. I think that's wrong. We've shown the tools. There's, you know, logging. There's all the data log stuff. Um, some of these things that I listed here, uh, the full suites of stuff are full GUIs, for seeing every single workload that's running inside your systems and you can give access to uh, non-developers so you can show them what the problems are. It will list every single issue and they can choose to ignore you or not. Um, so, you know, the tools are there. It's just a case of um, are you willing to pay for them? So, yeah. There we go. Yeah, AMA. <laughs> that was easy. Yeah.